A tea man cannot be made in a day. In this episode in winding up the series Salon Tea Revisits and Revival, today, we are giving you an exclusive story of a veteran tea man who retired as a one of the best tea manufacturing consultants slash advisors in the upcountry of Sri Lanka. He proves that unlike made tea made in a factory, a tea man cannot be made in a day, it takes years of dedication, hard work, and total commitment. This is the incredible story of Mr. Nellam Kamas in his own words. A son of tea soil. I grew up among the bushes, educated in a plantation district school, and like thousands of other, of other youth who passed out with a basic education, did not have any real prospects for a career of my choice. Most planting districts of the 1960s neither had any universities, no vocational schools, and no one in authority was bothered providing any. Captain in college soccer and cricket teams and taking lead roles in extracurricular activities did not help my dream for a more self-satisfying job wherever it would have really mattered. Finally, I took up a career in making tea as the last as that was the only career which came a little closer to my passion and dream to work with something to do in the field of science though years later I realized tea making is both an art as well as a science. Vanaraja, or king of the jungle, a large tea factory in the Dikkoya planting district, gave me a place to learn my first lesson in tea making, even though it was not my real choice. I took it up with enthusiasm as I was aware it was not that easy to find any job in the upcountry planting districts from Nuvare Lear to Candy except something in the plantation. I started learning the art of manufacture literally from the bottom of a tea leaf. The first and foremost area I learned to master was the process of withering leaf and my guide and teacher was the humble withering lead worker who must be dead and gone by now. Life was, for me as a creeper was never a bit of process. I had to cook my own meals, living in a bachelor's quarters where half a dozen youngsters lived in cramped condition or had ride a push cycle ho- some 8 miles to and from my home down a narrow road with more curves than a mountain python. Riding in the nights had been very dangerous as well. Even daytime riding was not easy due to the sharp winds one has to negotiate every other minute. I cannot forget an incident where I practically brushed with death. On that day, I was riding after doing the night shift, tired after a sleepless night when I was crossing a narrow bridge. I had to give way to an oncoming bus which I had not noticed before entering the bridge. I still shudder to think how I missed the bus by inches, crossing it within the tiny space I had and everything happened within a few seconds. Either I could have been run over by the bus or fallen down the bridge. I was so shaken up. I could not remember how I reached home and hit the bed. I learned my work the hard way. Most of my duty shifts were to cover entire nights when withering of leaf takes place. Continuous night work took a toll on my health as sleeping during the daytime did not give the same amount of rest to one's body which most human beings are used to. The only entertainment which kept up the spirits in me and the rest of the boys were the fun and frolic we somehow organized among ourselves whenever we had some extra time to spend. Before even reaching my 20th birthday, I was sent to a smaller factory but with a bigger charge. This move made me learn more about other aspects of tea manufacture like rolling, firing, fermenting, sorting and even packing. By now I learned how to tackle workers with different moods by working closely with them, even sharing their day-to-day personal problems. I knew how to shout at people twice or even thrice my age, though unwillingly. At the same time, I had to learn to keep their respect using my personal charm or through friendly persuasion. I learned that once the workers get to know their supervisor, everything becomes so easy to get a better output of work. Substandard work conditions are or unreliable machinery engenders unexpected problems for the entire workforce, supervisory staff and the management. My brush with serious accident locked me the second time. That day I was on duty and was in charge of the rolling department, which stage comes after visiting in the in the process of tea manufacture. I noticed one of the building used for pulling a set of pulleys was making an unusual noise. I reckoned it was due to an excessive belt pace used on the camel hair belt. As a young man as I was, I was eager to rectify the problem without summoning the more experienced technical assistant who was fast asleep in the warmth of the engine room. I quickly climbed on one of the tall platform ladders which was placed between the roller and a huge dry pulley which was driving the shaft and the roller and attempted to fix the belt properly into its place. All of a sudden, I noticed the belt had entangled with a belt slider. 
I heard a huge noise as if all hell broke loose as the steel slider broke from its place and came tumbling directly towards my head. The workers who were helping me from below were too stunned and frozen to react. When on some instinct, I jumped away from the slider and landed on the narrow space between two rollers which two were in the process of rolling, thus miraculously missing the huge drive belt and also the moving rollers. The slider menacingly crashed onto the wall where my head would have been seconds ago and thudded onto the ground. Only a miracle saved me on that day. As had it fallen on my head, I wouldn't have been here today to recall the incident. This incident taught me an unforgettable lesson to always be conscious on safety first for me and for all those who work in any tea factory. The lesson learned the hard way also helped me after some 30 years when I worked for another large factory as a processing manager to win a merit award for safety conducted by the Department of Labor of Sri Lanka. Soon thereafter, I found myself another bigger opening in a tea factory located at one of the highest elevations of Bhagavantarava, a small but smart looking factory overlooking the Bogo Valley. I became the senior assistant factory officer, something I was proud to have achieved at the young age of 21. At my new location, I was becoming accustomed to new machinery, different methods of manufacture due to different elevation of the factory and workers with a different mindset. The factory was undergoing improvement in order to fetch better prices for its produce. I was learning all the time and was even ready to be a man in charge of a small factory. During this period, something terrible happened at this factory. I was sleeping in my quarter and around 10.30 in the night, I was jolted out of bed due to the sound of a massive explosion coming from the factory, located about 30 feet from my quarters. I quick changed my clothes and ran to the drier side of the factory from where the noise came from. I noticed all the lights had gone off and it was pitch dark. It transpired the dryer heater had exploded and noticed some of the parts from the heater were still burning. For the next week or so, several engineers, top management personnel and experts arrived at the scene to conduct investigation to ascertain the cause of the ex explosion. The reason for the explosion ascertained by the chief fire department engineer was water accumulated in the service tank from which diesel fuel was drawn for the burn of the heater and this water being sprayed on the hot brick work of the heater resulting in the build up of hydrogen gas which resulted in the explosion. Many questions went unanswered in my mind even long after the matter was closed as an accident. After about 2 or 3 months, the actual reason came to light. Even though the person concerned neither agreed nor denied. This person, a factory watcher, was in the practice of placing a 2 litre tin of water on the edge of the burner to be used to make his cup of tea. That day, while trying to take it out, of, out to prepare his tea, he accidentally toppled the tin spilling the water on the burning fuel, extinguishing the fire but the diesel oil was not shut down. The oil was spraying on the hot bricks when the watcher had gone in search of the person in charge of the heater. Fortunately, the explosion took place before the watch watcher or the person in charge of the heater returned. Had it exploded when they were in the room, both would have lost their lives and I wouldn't have been able to find out the real reason for the explosion. This incident made me take precautionary measures in all other factories I worked throughout my career as a factory manager or when I visited many other factories as a consultant. To go to my place of work, I had to get down at a bus stop far from the estate and the steep climb on stone steps and paths that covered over a mile. There was another tea factory near the bus stop and whenever I passed through, I became acquainted with the officer in charge of the factory and we chatted about tea among other matters of worldly interest. One day, he asked if I would be interested in joining him at, at this factory as his immediate assistant. I was glad to agree mainly due to the fact this factory was just by the road and I would then be able to travel about much easily. Thus, I took up the new position at the roadside factory. However, I was constantly in the lookout for greener pastures. My urge took me to two other factories which gave me another break to be fully in charge of a factory where I was able to prove my worth by now as an experienced tea manufacturer. I have to mention something at this point. Years later, when I passed through this factory by the roadside, I was saddened the factory which once fetched high prices for its tea has been abandoned and is no more in production. In the early 1980s, I was successful in securing a new position in one of the top tea factories, Pedro, in Norelia region. 
from its lo location and field condition. I knew this was the place to give all of my effort. Soon, I started producing some of the best teas ever produced in this factory and gradually was recognized as one of the top tea manufacturers in the island. The teas from this factory fetch the highest prices at the Colombo Tea Auction and our net sale averages were topping the island, which record I was proud was unbroken for the next 10 years or so. During this period, the country was undergoing much political turmoil with two internal wars taking place one with the Tamil separatists in the north and the other due to a rebellion in the south. Constant blackouts, imperiled road transport, roadblock due to military checkpoint and rescue labor force and a variety of reasons made everybody live in fear and uncertainty. Despite all odds, we kept the wheels of tea production in motion without interruption. I cannot forget an incident which took place during this period. Our factory was compelled to implement certain austerity measures to cut down costs and one such measure was to switch off unnecessary lights during peak hours from 6 pm to 9 pm whenever possible as the cost per unit during this period was very high. In the meantime, the insurgents too had been implementing their curfews and total blackouts at their will as part of their war against the government. The military in its part insisted that no one should switch off the lights as commanded by the insurgents. It so happened, the factory lights were off on a day when the, there was no manufacture in progress. All of a sudden, at about 8 pm, a military vehicle arrived at our factory. The officer who came storming into our factory wanted to know why the lights had been turned off in a menacing tone. He wanted to know who was in charge and soon I had to present myself before him. They bundled me into the vehicle and took me straight to the army camp in the city and questioned me on the reason for switching off the factory light. The news of my arrest spread like wildfire within the estate and workers started gathering at the factory. My wife too panicked and was anxiously waiting for news from me. The days were such any person taken for questioning ended up somewhere else where no one would hear of him further. At the army camp, I was treated more politely after they realized my reputation as a responsible officer. I had to explain all the compelling reasons for the blacked out factory. The officers understood the situation, apologized for the inconvenience and took me back to the estate in their vehicle. By this time, the estate manager too came to know about this and was rushing towards the army camp. The vehicle I was being taken back had to cross his vehicle. I was greatly relieved when I got into his vehicle and went back to the factory to the welcome crowd of the workers and my family members who had been anxious. Like all good things that come to an end, my life at this factory too came to an end when I took up the factory manager's position in one of the largest properties in the whole region. The new place was challenged to me in a different way. As by now I had to build my house at Bandaravana and settle down with my family to enable my children attend school there. I used to rush down during weekends to look into their matters which somewhat became a problem personally. Therefore, I was compelled to look for a move somewhere closer to my house and took up the first opportunity when I was offered to take over one of the largest plantations in Uwa and Sri Lanka, that is Poonagara Group, about 20 kilometers from my house at Bandaragara. Until that time, Poonagara factory had been doing orthodox steel manufacture and the factory had to manufacture a large quantity of leaf received from many other estates around Poonagala since those small factories had to be closed down as cost saving measure. Poonagala as soon as I arrived was undergoing tremendous upgrading into a new mode called cut, twist and curl or CTC type of manufacture for which a number of new machinery had to be installed, some of which had to be imported from India. I was closely associated with the process of installment of CTC rollers and other relevant machinery. The entire work took up to about 10 months, during which time all the green leaf from Poonagala and other estates had to be transported to several small factories in the area for processing. The entire project was successfully completed in about 10 months. The manager, the group manager and the CTC consultant engineer all worked tirelessly to make this change a success. I quickly learned the art of CTC manufacture and Poonagala soon became one of the best known CTC factories in the island, fetching high prices at the Colombo auction and also becoming a profit making property for the company. My role with the entire operation was well recognized by the company and the suppliers of the factory machinery and was given a two week tour of some tea plantation in Assam in North India. This tour helped me to learn more about CTC manufacture and the maintenance of the machinery.
Having completed the changeover from Orthodox to CTC manufacture, we were able to manufacture around 2 million kilos of tea per annum. Poonagal Factory was the winner of the in the large scale manufacturing plant on safety in the OF province and won a merit award for the whole island. The knowledge gained here helped me to be a consultant to other CTC factories as well as orthodox factories after my retirement having served the industry for over 45 years. My soul will not be happy if I do not mention some of the greatest planters I have worked with in my long and illustrious career in the tea industry. I would mention only the top three here. Mr. Raymond Parnavitada. I was a young man of 26 when I joined St. John Delray Estate, Norwood as a senior assistant factory officer under the management of Mr. Parnavitan. At the beginning, I did not fully understand him. I kept working as usual, not aware that he had been closely monitoring my work. After he was transferred to Desperate Group, he wanted me to take charge of the factory and I had the opportunity to be the factory officer in charge at the young age of 30 years. Something extraordinary at that time. I consider this my first management appointment that I earned due to my outstanding work record. Mr. Parnavitana made my life easier due to his extraordinary manner in approaching any area of operational and administrative function with ease and efficiency. He was then assigned the position of Chairman Board 2 of the Sri Lanka State Plantations Corporation SLSPC. During his tenure in Board 2, he found many of the estates were not functioning to the potential and persuaded me to take up P2 estate factory in Aurelia, which position was vacant. I was very reluctant towards this move as it was well known in the plantation circle this factory had a bad reputation of its own. However, Mr. Parnavitana convinced me that I could put things right with his absolute backing from the top. Mr. Parnavitana later became the chairman central board of SLSPC and after a period of service emigrated to settle in Australia, a great loss to the tea industry. Tea planters of his caliber are very rare. He treated his employees very fairly and even his wife was a great social worker who went out of her way to help the poor with clothes and other donations as much as she could. I am glad that Mr. Parnavitana takes time to regularly communicate with me to date. Unfortunately, he passed away as some time back. Mr. Sunil Jayakodi Six months after I joined Pedro Estate, Mr. Sunil Jayakodi, a young, very talented, enthusiastic planter, joined the estate as manager. Together with myself, he quickly organized a team excellence which made Pedro get to the top in the chart for estates recording the highest profit in the country. During his 12 years on Pedro, the estate recorded the highest prices per tea, highest yield per hectare and the lowest cost of production, making the property one of the best performing estates in the whole of Sri Lanka. Due to his outstanding achievements, he was one of the best three planters selected to be sent to China. His task there was to teach black tea manufacture to the Chinese by studying Chinese method of making green tea. On his return, I was closely associated with him in producing a small con consignment of oolong tea, the first of its kind to be produced in Sri Lanka, on an experimental basis. The project fetched rupees 1000 per kilo, which was considered excellent during that time. Due to Mr. Jayakudi's outstanding administrative skills, he was selected to lead Muscale Plantation as the operations director when all state-owned plantations were leased out to private companies in 1992 for management. This move had impact in my own life as he wanted me to take a Poonagala factory which came under his management. Even though I was not experienced in TTC manufacture, I was persuaded to go there learn the art of CTC and do what was required to develop it up as one of the best CTC factories in the island, which I did with full glory. When I joined Poonagala in 1994, Mr. Vichy John Pile was the group manager who had joined nine months before me. Mr. Jayakudi was then promoted as CEO for Namrukula Plantation and later CEO at Kahawatta Plantation and back to Maskele Plantation as CEO from where he retired in 2013. Records were the highest yield and net sale average created by him at P2 Estates are unbroken, I believe, even up to now. Mr. Vijay John Pille. I would say Mr. John Pille is a great planter with a great heart. In my long list of eminent planters, he comes within the top three. I always remember the many days and nights we broke rest at Poonagala factory to bring the newly installed CTC machinery geared into optimum usage. Organizing the manufacture procedures and we made great strides in this regard. Soon, Poonagala was able to show for big profits and topping CTC manufactured tea prices in the island. Having served Poonagala for 8 years, he succeeded as manager Dambatana estate under Agrapatna plantation. Incidentally, he had served Dambatana as a manager 20 years prior to that 
when it was managed by SLSPC. Mr. John Pillay later left the country to work in Azerbaijan. A gentleman who treated his sub subordinates and workers fairly and earned the gra their greatest respect. When he had to drive up from Punagar to Bandaravala, people along the road used to wave to stop his vehicle to greet him and show their respect. Something rare nowadays. On his return from Azerbaijan, he joined whatever plantations as general manager, marketing and quality assurance. Presently, he is a marketing consultant at John Keel Tea Brokers. I am fortunate to have worked with such eminent planters and learned so much from them. This ends the final episode of the series, Salon Tea Revisits and Revival. Hope the series would have helped those who want to gain some knowledge on Salon Tea, some of the top tea processing centers in the island, its workers, managers, owners, and the various problems the industry has been experiencing during its 150 plus years of existence. Thank you all for watching.